On the 17th of January 2007, players were about to step through the dark portal for the first time, about to enter World of Warcraft's first ever expansion, The Burning Crusade, a new level cap of 70, two new races introduced, a new profession, sockets, 11 new zones, 25 new instances, the arena system, a talent revamp, many factions, hundreds of quests, and of course, a new planet to explore. And yes, you heard me right, 11 zones and 25 instances. The Burning Crusade launched with so much content that it's, uh, well, impossible to fit all of launch into this one video. Indeed, it actually took months for even the bleeding edge players to clear what was available at launch and the reason why you'll find out today. So therefore, we're going to be following the player's journey here from their first steps in Outland all the way to the beginning of their Burning Crusade raiding journey. It all kicked off a week before launch when the Dark Portal roared to life. Demons of the Burning Legion poured through from the shattered world of Draenor, and they descended upon the forces of Nethergard Keep and the Argent Dawn, plus, of course, adventurers from all across the land who were there to complete the one available quest in this event, called Into the Breach. They would have to kill six invading demons, but, of course, being the older days of World of Warcraft, it became a race to actually tag mobs. Completion of this quest, though, would reward players with a tabard that had an on-use effect that lit up their screen, a rather fitting way to celebrate a player's tagging prowess. The pre-patch also replaced Lord Kazak with High Lord Krull, who would actually spawn in different locations around Azeroth. Now, his enrage timer was only a single minute. That made him significantly more deadly of a boss. But that week would pass, and the day would finally come, where players would step through the dark portal for their very first time. And it truly was a memorable experience. The incredible, massive exit portal with tiered steps leading to hordes of demons being held back by a thin red and blue line. Broken terrain, floating islands, demonic architecture, all of these things could be seen way off in the distance, all framed by that famous awe-inspiring skybox. It was truly breathtaking at the time, and it was a rather experimental step into science fiction for the team. It was just stuff that we quite simply had not seen on Azeroth before. This series is brought to you by our patrons, and the next episode of it is live there right now. And after you're done with that, well, there's a bunch of vlogs for you to watch as well, plus, of course, our physical loot. And man, April is a big month, especially if you're into TBC, priests, and pins. Here is the whip thumbnail of this month's special. Next episode, you'll get to see what it looks like after our illustrator has been through that whip. April is also rather fittingly troll month, so you'll get this gorgeous troll pack. And of course, it's also priest month, so you'll get the priest class pin. Now, here is what our hunter pin looks like, and here is the priest layout to give you an idea. Things are a little bit slow right now in terms of production because of the global situation, so we'll be shipping out those pins as soon as we receive them. Our patrons make this series directly possible. We thank them for it, and with that, let us get into the Burning Crusade. In 2020, because of the Legion expansion's backstory, we've got a pretty well-defined Outland plotline. It goes that after the destruction of Nathrezel by the Illidari, Kil'jaeden lured the forces of Azeroth to Outland as a way to deal with Illidan. Well, 2007 was a more ponderous time for the lore. The original justification was that Doomlord Kazak found a way to open the Dark Portal from Azeroth and then took control of Burning Legion forces with an invasion being planned. And apparently, in response to this, Bolvar and Thrall decided that the best defense was a strong offense. So, just like in Warcraft 2, beyond the Dark Portal, we once again invaded Draenor. Of course, that is a plotline that would change over time. What did we find when we went there, though? Well, it was a new continent, but it was framed as the remnants of a destroyed planet, and because of that, it felt expansive, it felt alien. Hellfire Peninsula engendered a vigilance like no zone before. You'd be killing your 100th Felbor, you'd notice your screen shake a little bit, you'd hear that now iconic sound, you'd turn around to face it, and there it would be, the legendary Fell Reaver of the Burning Crusade. You'd then journey onwards to Zangermarsh, the home of the Draenei refugees and native Sporlings. 
another zone that was totally alien and a trend that would also be continued by other zones, such as Nagrand with its rolling hills and iconic soundtrack. There's then the mystical forests of Terracor, the previous home of the new Draenei race, complete with their capital city of Shatrath and the mysterious mass crypt of Ockendoon. Things only got darker from there on though, as we then had the nether blasted wastes of Netherstorm, which were of course contrasted by the ethereal's incredible ecodomes, and then Shadow Moon Valley, home of Black Temple, the Illidari, many demons, and all around just a horrible, horrible, dangerous place. It truly was a stunning new world, one that felt like Warcraft, but in a way that we'd never really seen before. Players then soon found themselves hanging out in the new, neutral capital city of Shatrath. Now, it hosted the remnants of the Broken and was a clearing ground for the Alliance and for the Horde. Now, its two main factions, the Aldor, an ancient order of Draenei priests, and the Scryers, a faction of Blood Elves who rebelled against Kilthas, they maintained icy relations at either side of the city. And that was all centered on Adal, our new Naru boss and his faction, the Shatar, who of course are actually a part of the Army of the Light. Players would choose then between the Aldor and the Scryers, though of course, siding with one would make the other one hated with you and they would attack you on sight. Then aside from the major powers, Shatrath was also a true melting pot, being home to refugees from across the broken planet. Blizzard really did capture that feeling very well at the time, especially with places like Worlds and Tavern that eventually would hold quite a special place in players' hearts. The High Elves were cousins of the Night Elves, forced into exile thousands of years ago after the Burning Legion's first invasion and eventually settling over powerful ley lines in Kalthalas. Now, their lust for magic, which of course got them exiled in the first place, hadn't really abated, so they sated that with the Sun Well, and they created the Sun Well with a vial of water taken from the Well of Eternity. Over the next centuries, a lot happened. You know, they had the Troll Wars, they taught humanity magic, but they ended up having the Sun Well, and most of the their population being destroyed by Arthas's scourge, and after that event, they named themselves the Blood Elves. Now, the absence of the Sunwell brought about a caustic addiction to magic. Prince Kael'thas took the strongest of the Blood Elf people, and he followed Illidan to Outland in search of a cure to their arcane addiction. And then those which remained behind in Azeroth ended up being our playable Blood Elves in this new expansion. Their capital city of Silvermoon reflected the grandiose nature of the Blood Elves, but it held within it a dark secret, something very much on theme. A captured Naru whose raw power was actually being drained to fuel the elven addiction to magic, and this would end up being a major plot point for their paladins. Venturing outside of Silvermoon, they found Eversong Forest, their idyllic starting zone. Players would deal with the aftermath of the Sunwell's destruction, they'd be clearing wretched addicts from the city, and they'd venture out then to deal with some of the Scourge, some of the Trolls, and just generally consolidate their position in Kalthalas before pushing onwards to the Ghostlands, their level 10 through 20 zone. And there, they dealt with the far more strong remnants of the Scourge and established their relationship with the Forsaken. The Blood Elves had thematic racials that really did reflect their affinity with magic, including Arcane Torrent that was a two-second AoE silence at the time. Then their only dedicated tanking class was actually the Paladin, and, uh, well, they were the Horde yes, first and only paladins. Called Blood Knights, they actually drained power from the captured Naru uh, that was in Silvermoon, but that's a storyline that would be continued quite a bit over time through the game. Now, the Blood Elves were also considered the first pretty race for the Horde, and because of that, they became wildly popular, and it's actually meant that since then, they've been the largest percentage of Horde characters. That was actually true back then, and it is held true to this very day. We had interacted with the Draenei in Warcraft 3, but these new elegant blue creatures were a world away from their broken cousins, the ones originally called Draenei in Warcraft 3. So, it's quite an interesting story. Originally, the Aradar were from the world of Argus, but the Draenei broke off from them and made a hasty escape whenever Sargaris turned their people to the Burning Legion. They traveled the Great Dark Beyond in their dimensional ships and eventually came across the world of Draenor, and that is where they then took 
on the name Drenai, meaning exiled ones. They settled there and there was peaceful coexistence with the native races of the planet until their fallen Aradar brothers got wise to them. And this led to the orcs drinking Manoroth's blood and their eventual degradation into the horde of Warcraft 1. These orcs would commit a genocide on the Draenei, but a vanishingly small number were able to go into hiding. This group would eventually then recapture their ship, the Exodar, and they would escape Outland. Unfortunately for them though, Blood Elf saboteurs damaged the engines causing their ship to crash land. So new Draenei players would wake up to explore this alien world of Azeroth, starting by aiding survivors of the crash on the Azure Mist Isles, where they'd also go and meet an Alliance expedition. Then their next zone, Blood Mist Isle, saw them take the fight to the Blood Elves who sabotaged them in the first place. These new Draenei were rather controversial at the time, I think it's fair to say. They were a radical reimagining of what players had thought the Draenei to be, and they also led to a fairly major retcon of past lore regarding Sargaris. Blizzard placed these new Draenei and their leader, and of course the Naru, at the center of a galaxy-wide struggle that previously had been left far more mysterious. So in the initial days, really people didn't know what to make of these new space goats. Though of course, many did enjoy their skull-crushing thighs, and because of that, they would go on to be an extremely popular race in the game. Now, their racial, the gift of the Naru, reflected their connection to the light, giving them a little bit of a heal, and they also had a bonus to jewel crafting, which was this expansion's brand new profession. The new jewel crafting profession came alongside the introduction of sockets, and they all worked together. So players would create gems, and those gems would have stat bonuses, and they would be socketed into gear. And Blizzard's goal with this system was for sockets and gems to increase player agency and give you more customization. Now, this was at a time where stats like hit, defense, and expertise existed, and that really meant that being able to tweak your stats with these was a welcome addition. A piece of gear would have a red, yellow, blue, or meta gem socket with you getting corresponding colors of gems. Jewel crafters, though, did have more than just gems. They could also make rings, necklaces, trinkets, and helms. Indeed, crafting would actually be an extremely important part of the Burning Crusade, really like it was for vanilla. So stay tuned for our next episode, which is going to go deeper into the design and the impact of the, I'd say, fairly iconic crafting systems of the Burning Crusade. So you've rolled one of the new races, you've grinded your way through the pre-nerf leveling experience and you've conquered the town levels of Outland. So then, what is next for you, an aspiring TBC player? Well, you would have had several options, including the new heroic dungeons, plus the 10 and 25 man raids. But what we're really talking about here, though, is attunements, which we are going to focus on on today's episode, before going more into depth on raids in the next one. These attunements are seriously hardcore. So, to get attuned for Mount Hyjal's raid, you would need the Vials of Eternity. Illidan filled these vials with the power of the Well of Eternity before its destruction. Now, one of these was held by Lady Vash in Serpent Shrine Cavern, and the other one by Kelthas Sunstrider in the Eye of Tempest Keep. Now, to attune for Serpent Shrine and Cavern to get your first vial, well, you would need to have completed Karazhan and its optional boss, Nightbane. But then to get into Karazhan, well, you will have needed to have completed all of the Caverns of Time dungeons. And getting into Karazhan would actually then require a further key to actually get in, and that was gathered from Medivh in the opening of the Dark Portal instance. So that's the path to one vial. What about the other one? Well, this one is also pretty involved. Getting Kael'thas's vial required the Cipher of Damnation. Now, this thing was actually part of a 25-part quest line. Yes, 25 parts. Once complete, Khadgar would then send players on three trials. The Trial of Strength, Mercy, and Tenacity. Each of these trials would require the player to complete a heroic dungeon, and that leads us on to heroic dungeons. These were a brand new feature for this expansion that increased the difficulty and the reward of dungeons. And some of these were so hard that you kind of needed some of the first tier of raid gear to complete, or at least sort of was thought at the time. They really were pretty intense. Now, getting into heroic was very different from just the simple right-click difficulty selection of today, though, as each dungeon hub, well, that would require a key to zone into its heroics. Now, these keys came from the factions that were related to the dungeons, so the Trial of Tenacity sent players to save Millhouse Manastorm from the Alcatraz. Doing this, though, 
Well, that required the Warp Forged Key, and that was only available once revered with the Shatar faction. But, of course, the Alcatraz actually required a further key for the gate in front of the instance portal. Now, this involved an 11-step quest with the Ethereals and the Dreadlords, ending up with a clearing of the Mechanar and the Botanica. This was also true for the Trial of Mercy, which sent players to heroic Shattered Hulls, which, of course, required a further key from the Fell Reaver that patrolled Hellfire Peninsula. And then we've got the final trial, Strength. Now, this was completed in heroic Steam Vaults, which meant that it required the Reservoir Key, which was acquired from the Scenarian Expedition faction. You then also would need to do Shadow Labs, and this required the Akunai Key, which came from the Lower City faction. Now, the Shadow Labyrinth uh, dungeon, well, that required a further key <laughs> from the final boss of Sethic Halls, which is another dungeon. So I think you can see here that this was a truly massive interconnected web of content that took players on a humongous journey across the hardest pre-raid content in Outland. This took months and months to complete. It was really an incredible journey. And it was also a barrier to new characters later on, so it did have its pros and its cons. Now, getting back to our trials, well, what did you get? What happened after the three heroic dungeon trials were completed? Well, to attune for Serpent Shrine, you needed to complete Gruul's Lair and Karazhan's optional boss, Nightbane. Now, to get into Karazhan, you needed to complete all of the Caverns of Time dungeons, as I mentioned, but, of course, getting into Karazhan would also require the further key, and that key was gathered from Medivh, which was in the opening of the Dark Portal instance. Now, this instance needed <laughs> its own attunement, of course, and that attunement was completed by laboriously escorting Thrall through the Old Hillsbrid dungeon. Yes, there really is quite a lot here. This attunement process is rather legendary, and it's something that Blizzard really would never actually attempt again in such a hardcore way. I mean, graphs like this, they were both helpful tools, but also a testament to the masses of content of the game, and maybe in some cases, they were a bit of an icon of what this system was like. Yes, it did create an adventure. It did ensure that by the time the players entered raids, well, they had completed the most, you know, the other most challenging content in the game. Yet at the same time, it was also a massive barrier to entry, especially on alts, and that would factor in in the future. Now, as you can see here, Karazhan and Gruul's Lair were the first new raids. Now, while Gruul was a small raid, Karazhan was quite a bit more substantial, and it would actually remain the stomping ground of new raiders really for the lifetime of this expansion. As opposed to Medivh, the Mad Hermit's Tower, Karazhan was this huge, grandiose mansion, and it's one that became increasingly unhinged as you explored it. It was filled with many victims of Medivh's insanity and the other opportunistic political parties that he hosted, all things that he did while under the subtle influence of Sargaris in the older days of the WoW lore. Now, Karazhan had, even for the time, a pretty convoluted attunement. The aim was to obtain the Master's Key, to open the door to the tower. Now, this was done by investigating magical disturbances all around Azeroth and Outland, and you were doing this with the Kirin Tor. So after going on that adventure, dealing with your Violet Eye reputation and a whole bunch of other things, you'd actually get into the raid. And it's an interesting one. It famously included the opera and chess events, which were highly creative, if eventually rather repetitive. And the raid culminated in the Nether Space, which is a place where the Twisting Nether is actually anchored to Karazam. And up there, you would deal with Maltazar, Erdar Prince of the Burning Legion, the final boss. He was an odd one because he actually dropped the two-handed axe Gorhal. Now, Gorhal was Grom Hellscream's weapon. There is no canonical reason for why he had it, other than, you know, it looked cool and it just appeared in the nether, so a bit of an odd one. Past that, though, there was the optional summonable boss, Nightbane, a twisted dragon who had actually been killed by Medivh during a confrontation with his mother, Eguin pretty interesting situation because it was also part of the Serpent Shrine Caverns attunement. As you can see, in the Burning Crusade, everything truly was connected. The clear times that we're about to cover, well, they do make sense in the context of the legendary attunement process of TBC. Yes, it really did take players months to complete this stuff. The expansion launched on the 16th of January. Karazhan was cleared 12 days later on the 28th, with Grull going down on the 3rd of February. Then Magtheridon, the single boss of Hellfire Citadel, died on the 24th, with Lady Vash of Serpent Shrine going down a month later, a month 
on the 29th of March. And remember, these are just the first kills. Patch 2.1, the Black Temple launched on the 22nd of May, with Kael'thas, who was a part of a launch raid, only being killed three days later. So yes, it took the entirety of four months for players to get caught up before Black Temple's launch, with the achievement for Hyjal actually still outstanding. This truly was a hero's journey. This was long, it was hard, and it was absolutely stuffed with content for players to do. World of Warcraft, by this point, had cemented itself as the industry standard MMORPG. It had exceeded all expectations and now held a growing population of just over 8 million players, a number which, of course, was set only to rise. In the next three episodes of this series, we will document this landmark expansion, including daily quests, crafting new reputations, new raids, a whole bunch of stuff, what players were actually doing, and the patch zone that actually set the template still falls to this day over a decade later. So, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to check out the next one, you can do so right now over in Patreon, and while you're there, you can also pick up our great physical monthly loot that we will post out to you. So, thank you very much for watching this episode, and with that, I'll see you next time.